Uh, and thank you for joining us here. This is the 16th year of the Newburyport Literary Festival, uh, the second virtual uh, version of it. Um, and we are just thrilled to have you all here. Uh, as you may know, we are using the webinar feature of Zoom. And so you can see us, but we can't see you. But please feel free to utilize the chat to speak with your uh, fellow attendees. Uh, and also, uh, if you have any questions, please do not put those in the chat. If you have questions that you'd like to ask of the, of the author and presenter, please put that in the Q&A format so we can keep track of the questions a little bit more easily. Uh, so thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Bethany groff -Durow. I'm a writer and historian. For today's purposes, I am the host um, as part of the steering committee of the Newburyport Literary Festival. And uh, Nina here, I just had a panic attack and realized I don't know if it's Nina or Nina. Nina. Nina, Nina. I've been doing it right. Woohoo! <laughs> Wonderful. <sighs> Nina uh, is a festival regular at this point. She's been... Yeah. Uh, one of the favorite authors for our New England History um, panel. And uh, I have just loved this book and I'm thrilled that you're here to join us today, um, Nina. And I will say also, if you are interested in buying this or any of other Nina's other books, please do so at a local bookstore. They need your help now more than ever. Uh, two of our partner bookstores are Jabberwocky Bookshop in Newburyport and the Bookshop of Beverly Farms, mm -hmm. obviously in Beverly Farms. So please, uh, I'll put links to both of those bookshops in the chat once we get going. Um, but if you have a local bookshop that's closer to where you live, please uh, support them. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Nina Sankovic. <laughs> Wonderful. And let me say a couple nice things about you before I, I make you okay. talk. Uh, Nina Sankovic claims to be happy as a clam to be returning to the New Newport <laughs> Literary Festival. Yes. She's written three other books of nonfiction. Tolstoy in the Purple Chair, My Year of Magical Reading, a memoir of the year she spent reading a book a day following the death of her sister, The Lowells of Massachusetts, An American Family, a multi-generational biography of one of New England's most influential families, and American Rebels, How the Adams, Hancock, and Quincy Families Fan the Flames of Revolution, which explores the intimate connections between three families in the years leading up to the Declaration of Independence. She writes for media outlets, including the New York Times and the LA Times and blogs on Medium. Sankovic attended, ooh, my scroll just went crazy. Sankovic <laughs> attended Tufts University and Harvard Law School and currently lives in Connecticut. For more information, please visit her website, www.readallday.org. And over to you, Nina, thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Um, and thank you to the Newburyport Literary Festival, my absolutely favorite festival ever. Um, the Newberry Liter Newburyport Literary Festival was the first festival to step up last year and go completely virtual, um, and yet also kept its ideals of great talks, engaged audiences, a wide range of authors and topics, uh, and just an all around wonderful vibe, wonderful energy. Um, I look forward to when we're all back together again in person um, in Newburyport and we can visit the great bookshops that Bethany talked about. Um, but the virtual works too. Um, we're here together and so let's get started. So you have, um, you have on your screen, you should have on your screen, uh, a picture, an actual these are the actual letters um, that I'm gonna talk about today. These are letters that I discovered in my own backyard. Um, I discovered a treasure of letters in a rotting trunk hidden amid the weed infested garden of the house that I had just bought um, with my husband. In that, in that uh, garden, there was a shed and in that shed, there was a trunk and in that trunk, I found a lifetime's worth of mail. Just bundles and bundles of letters tied up with ribbons and stacked one upon another. There we go. Most of the letters were still in their envelopes um, with notes scrawled across the top. Um, the first one I pulled out read, received April 4th, 98. That was 1898. I had found 100 year old plus letters in my backyard. Um, my husband and I had just moved into the house. It was a crumbling but beautiful old home in need of a lot of loving care 
on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, when we bought the house, we'd seen the old shed in the backyard, but had not thought to investigate its contents. And it was in that shed, as I said, that we found the rotting trunk full of letters. The letters were all addressed to, I think you can probably make it out there. It says, Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt J. Seligman. They're addressed that way or to Addie Bernheimer or to Addie Bernheimer Seligman. So these were obviously the letters of Addie Bernheimer Seligman. So I did a quick internet search, which revealed that Addie was born in New York City in 1856. She grew up in a townhouse on West 14th Street, the daughter of an affluent Jewish family. And in June of 1878, she married DeWitt Seligman, scion of an even more affluent banking family. And here is um, just one of the many wedding announcements that I also found in the trunk. Also, newspapers from 1878 um, reporting on here, you can see it's called a brilliant wedding. I also found in the trunk glass plate photographs of Addie and DeWitt on their honeymoon at Niagara Falls. And here is the glass plate photograph. It's, it, it was cracked. Um, I mean, it's old, obviously. Um, and I'm going to enhance the photograph a bit for you now that you've seen the magnificent Niagara Falls in the background. Here is, uh, here, here, uh, is the happy honeymoon couple. You can see they're quite elegantly dressed. Um, and you may see that she has a bonnet on. And I also found in the trunk the actual bonnet that Addie had worn on her honeymoon, in which she then preserved in paper as a keepsake. So here is the bonnet as it looks today. I mean, it's amazingly beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it, it was, it's from June 1878, and yet the colors are vibrant. Those purple silk flowers are just gorgeous. So Addie and DeWitt um, had three children. Ethel, who was my connection to the letters because uh, she was the first owner of the house that I now owned in New York City. Then there was a, a second child, Alma, another girl. And their third child was James. James was Addie's youngest child and only son. The letters in the trunk were mostly written by James, as I discovered as I went through them. Although I also found lovely letters written um, by Addie's adoring husband, including this one, which is from 1879, April 29th. 1879, um, in which she, uh, they are, uh, he writes about expecting their first child. And he says, a responsibility will soon be upon you. It will be a B A B B B A B A. Does he spell it right? B A B Y. A little bit of a thing uh, which you can put in your pocket or stick up your nose for shelter when it rains. So it's just a charming letter. He goes on to give her advice for how to care for this baby that's coming into their life. Uh, he says, keep its toes scrupulously clean. Do not allow our child to eat foie gras in the first three days of life. But by the sixth day, the child should be ready for baseball. And by the 10th, the child can run for Congress. So it's just a charming letter. And what I love about it is, although it is 140 years old, it's very contemporary. It could have been written today. Um, it's so full of love and humor and also just wonderful expectation of the baby uh, to come. Uh, but as I said, most of the letters in the trunk were written by James. Uh, and the letters dated from about the time he was four years old in 1894 until the time of Addie's death in 1937. So here are some of the early letters from James, very sweet. Hundreds of letters from son to mother and almost everyone signed your loving son, James. During the four years that James was at Princeton from 1908 to 1912, he wrote to his mother as often as three times a day. 
Now back then the mail was delivered twice a day and it was quite speedy. If he uh, sent a postcard in from Princeton on a Tuesday, it would arrive to his mother in Manhattan by Wednesday. Um, and he's, he wrote a lot of postcards, but he also, uh, he also wrote longer letters and he kept writing letters to his, to his mother and to his father. Um, but a lot more, it seems, to his mother. But he kept writing letters after college as he began his career, got married, um, and traveled the world. So here are letters that he's written from around the world, including one he wrote from aboard the Mauritania. Now, my favorite letters are the ones James wrote from college. These letters showed me a young man with a robust appetite for experience, for for pleasure, for fun. Um, I'm gonna quote from one of, from some of his letters. Here's, here's the first one. He writes to his mother, I am getting a good college education, developing like a film, apologizing to the grass every time I step on it, scrambling like an egg, yelling like a bear and telling the upperclassmen to go to hell. Studying did not seem to interest James too much. He, he writes in one letter, I'll study later after my nap. And he found fun just everywhere he went. He writes, I saw the game with Penn last night. It was interesting. The game? Oh no, the girl I was sitting next to. A typical college student, James always seemed to be in need of money. He writes, my supply of cash is almost extinct. I haven't opened a bank account as you advised me not to. So that's how the math stands. The latest is black garters, so I blew myself to a pair. Hint, hint, send more money. And money was sent. I cashed your first check and found very little trouble in cashing it. In fact, if you have any more checks you need cashed, Kindly forward the same and I will oblige. Four years of college later, he's still happy for the checks. Your letter and your check couldn't have possibly been more welcome, especially the latter. If you send a check with every letter, write as often as you want, twice a day if necessary. Well, I have to give James credit um, for always asking nicely and always saying thank you. <laughs> Finding the letters of James Seligman inspired me to write a book about letters. A part of it was that my uh, oldest son was, was going off to college himself. And I wondered, will he write to me the way James wrote to his mother? I mean, of course not, right? We live in an age of texts and emails and those are great and I love getting them, but I wanted letters also. So I wondered why was it so important to me to get a letter? What is so significant about letters that makes them you know, a, a form of communication that meant so much to me. What is it that's unique about letters? So I decided I was going to research that question. I was going to go on a quest to really define what it is about letters that makes them so special. And I researched back through thousands of years of letter writing. I went um, through my own saved correspondence. I went through university and town archives historical collections in libraries, and the personal letters sent to me by friends um, and published collections of letters. In my book that came out of my research and my intense hunt for the exact qualities of letters that make them so vital, I identify the specific qualities of letters and I illustrate those qualities by telling stories from history, uh, ancient history to contemporary history, and with some of my own personal history thrown in. The qualities of letters that I identify include the privacy that's afforded by letter writing and the uniqueness of every letter. How letters offer proof of love, of danger, of commitment, of friendship, of history. Um, reading allows us to be a fly on the wall of the letter of the life of the letter writer. We are there with the letter writer experiencing life as they have experienced it. Letters offer grace and generosity. For example, in the thank you letters that we write and the condolence letters that we write. 
I also think that letters are a very effective medium for offering advice because it gives that space between advice giver and advice taker. It allows them to read the advice and think about it without having to answer right away. Letters allow us to leave a legacy behind of our own lives and of the lives of our family and friends. And letters are a bridge between the past and present. I mean, when I'm holding the letters of Jane Seligman, I'm holding a, a page that he held, looking at the, the, the writing that he made with a pen. And it's just, an, it's, it, it is a connection, a physical connection between the past and the present. Um, and also bridge, it, letters are a bridge between um, ourselves and people who are far away in the present time. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. The ancient Egyptians wrote thousands of letters to each other. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating, thousands and thousands. And this is amazing because only a tiny percentage of Egyptians could read or write. So how did they do this? How did they send letters? They went to a professional to do it. They went to a scribe and they paid that scribe to read and write letters for them. If they didn't have the money for a scribe, they, 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 they hooked up with their educated friends and relatives and posed upon them. You know, I need a letter written. It's very important. Thousands of Egyptian letters have been discovered in the past century or so, covering almost all periods of the Egyptian kingdoms. And the importance of letters in Egypt can be seen in this ad the advice that I, that I found in the letter, advice sent by a professional scribe to his young apprentice. And he writes, apply yourself to this noble profession of being a scribe. You will find it useful. Love writing, shun dancing. Then you become a worthy official. Befriend the scroll, the palate. It pleases more than wine. Writing pleases more than bread and beer, more than clothing and ointment. It is worth more than an inheritance in Egypt than a tomb in the West. That was how important being a scribe was, that it was more worth more than an inheritance or a tomb. All of the uh, Egyptian letters that I read in my research included the language, it's one sentence, it is good if the Lord takes note. Now this seemed to me to be an acknowledgement of the importance of the written message and gratitude in having it read and then acted upon. In other words, the letter was an offering and usually there was some kind of request in the letter and to express thanks for the letter, the request would be granted. Now these messages of thanks and requests for something to be done didn't only go to the living. The ancient Egyptians wrote to their dead relatives, expressing thanks for all that had been done for them while they were alive, and then asking for a bit more help. Clearly, the ancient Egyptians expected that in gratitude for a well-written letter, the asked for favor would be carried out even from beyond the grave. Perhaps one of the strongest qualities of a letter is how it builds a bridge. Again, this idea of a bridge between past and present. And, and I'm going to talk about that. But letters also create a bridge between those who are far away from us in the present time. Um, most of us in these, this past year of COVID have missed the presence of family members or friends. And quarantine has kept us away from, from friends. And one way to reach them, to connect to them, is by letter. Letters that we write to our friends or, or a family member are unique, singular communications meant for one person, written for one person, and written with care and time and attention. It is such a gift to receive a letter that's been written just for you. When we write a letter, we're creating a moment uh, between the person we're writing to and us. We're creating a, 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 a moment of privacy. And what I love about letters is that when we send it off, we don't expect an immediate response, unlike what we expect and hope for in our emails and texts. When we send off our letter, we don't check for updates or changes in status. We go back to our lives and we do things 
so that we have more to write about in our next letter. The privacy afforded by letters is also very important when so many other forms of communication are, are under surveillance or open to public scrutiny. When we write a letter, we expect it to be for, for one person only. We write freely and openly, and we share what is in our heart. Legally, our letters are protected. To, to mess with the US mail is a felony offense. Practically, uh, we can also protect our letters, hiding them away or destroying them if we don't want anyone else to read them. In 1578, the poet Sir Philip Sidney worried that his father's personal secretary was reading the letters that Philip sent home. So he wrote a note directly to the secretary, warning him against violating the sanctity of letters. And he wrote, if I ever know you do so much as read any letter I write to my father without his commandment or my consent, I will thrust my dagger into you. <laughs> One of the letters which Addie Seligman had in her trunk had a note scrawled across its envelope. And the note read, nobody to read this. Well, I admit, when I saw those letters, that the scrawled words, I confess that I only wanted to read the letter more. I mean, I wanted to know so much. What, what was in this letter that was so terrible? The letter had been written by James, I could tell that. And it was postmarked um, Deauville, France in August of 1923. No, it was an old letter, so any scandal it contained was long past. And I, of course, I respect the privacy of letters, but I also thought, well, this letter is part of history now, and I'm a historian, and I want to know what, what's in that letter. And I couldn't stop myself, so I opened it, and I read it. What I found inside was a, a bit of gossip about Peggy Guggenheim, who was a cousin of James. Peggy Guggenheim was the daughter of wealthy banker Benjamin Guggenheim. Benjamin and his wife, Florette, who was uh, the sister to James' father, DeWitt. Jane, uh, Benjamin and Florette went down on the Titanic and they left to their daughter, Peggy, a considerable fortune and the freedom to do as she wished. And what Peggy wished to do was to collect art and collect men, go to parties and have a good time. So James had written to his mother about seeing his cousin Peggy in Europe and noted that she was chaperoning a weird looking man who may or may not be the father of her child. I did a little research and found the weird looking man was probably Lawrence Bell. He was a Dada sculptor and a free spirit who would be, uh, become Guggenheim's first husband and was the father of her two children. Now, I'm not sure if the scandal that Addie didn't want revealed was uh, that the parentage of Peggy's child was uncertain or that the man she was with was weird or that she was chaperoning him. I really don't know what was so scandalous. But whatever it was, Addie did not want anyone to read this letter. But if she didn't want anyone to read the letter, why didn't she destroy it? Why did she say all those letters that James wrote her over all those years, including a letter containing what she considered to be a shameful family secret? What kind of letters demand such devoted preservation? I've lost many letters over the years. Um, I've also destroyed some old love letters I didn't want around anymore. I know there are letters packed away in boxes in my attic, but I'm not sure who wrote them or when. But I know exactly where to find every single note, drawing, and card made for me over the years by my children in a green metal trunk on the second floor landing of my house. There it is. I walk by that trunk every morning when I go down to start my day and every night when I head back to bed. This green trunk is a constant reminder of all the joy my children have brought me. Even now when they're grown up, 
they're still here with me in my house in their letters. I think Addie saved every letter from James, even the one about Peggy, to preserve those moments she shared with her son, moments that he had taken to write to her and moments that she had taken to read those letters. Here's a letter from James that he wrote in 1919. She wanted to be able to go back again and again to share the moments to keep James beside her. I donated all the letters James wrote while at Princeton to the Princeton Archives, located in the Sealy G. Mudd Manuscript Library. After donate, donating them, I heard from the then director, Daniel Linke, that he had put a, a student to work organizing the letters. And he wrote to me that she found the trove of letters awesome and that she found herself really finding, like falling in love with him as I did when I read the letters. I mean, she's, she, Linky wrote to me, my student is 105 years younger than Seligman, but he may be gaining another admirer. And it, it makes me so happy to see how James' story is continuing to be heard. And all because of the letters he wrote, letters that his mother then saved and letters that I was unlucky enough to find in my own backyard. Jack Trice was the first black student to play football for Iowa State College. During his first major game against the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis in October, 1923, Trice suffered a broken collarbone in the first quarter. Despite the pain, Trice refused to sit out. He played on through to the third quarter when he was thrown on his back and trampled on by three Minnesota players in what many saw as a race-motivated attack. Trice was taken off the field and sent to the hospital. Doctors declared him fit to travel back to Iowa. But two days later, Trice died as a result of the injuries he received during the game with Minnesota. He left behind family, a fiance, and the over 4,000 fellow students and faculty who attended his funeral. Just before Trice was buried, a letter was found in the pocket of his suit jacket. It was a letter he'd written to himself the night before the Minnesota game. He wrote, my thoughts just before the real college game of my life, the honor of my race, family, and self is at stake. Everyone is expecting me to do big things. I will. Be on your toes every minute if you expect to make good. He signed the letter, Jack. The football stadium of Iowa State University is now called the Jack Trice Stadium. In front of the stadium, there's a brown statue of Trice standing with one knee up, foot resting on a ledge, head bent down, reading the letter he holds in his hand, the letter he wrote to himself for his last game. In 1998, a burial ground in South Korea was excavated to make way for new housing. During excavation of the tombs, a burial chamber was discovered and a letter that had been placed with the occupant came to light. It was over 400 years old, written by a wife to her dead husband in the 16th century. She wrote, you used to tell me that we would live together until our hairs turned gray and we would die together. How come you forget that and go away first and leave me behind? Take me with you now because I cannot live after losing you and I want to follow your way. I cannot let go of my heart towards you in this world and my grief is endless. My heart is so torn apart. It was a common practice in Korea at the time to bury family letters with the body of the deceased. And in this tomb, there were 17 other letters written to the dead man. But it is the wife's letter that's so alive that, that she seems to be there tugging on our sleeves for an answer to her question, why did he leave me? Read this carefully, she writes. Come to me in my dreams and tell me all. 
I believe I will see you in my dreams. Most of the letters I read today were written long ago. Letters that I find in library collections and historical archives, old books, in a friend's attic. Through these letters, I meet people, some of them known to me, like this wonderful letter written by Vincent van Gogh um, with a lovely little sketch added in for the delight of his brother, Theo, who was the recipient of the letter. Or the letter that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote to his daughter, um, counseling her about things to worry about and things not to worry about. So he wrote, worry about courage, worry about cleanliness, worry about efficiency, worry about horsemanship. Don't worry about popular opinion, dolls, the past, the future, growing up. Don't worry about anybody getting ahead of you. Don't worry about triumph or failure. Don't worry about mosquitoes. Don't worry about flies. Don't worry about insects in general. Don't worry about boys. Don't worry about disappointments. Don't worry about pleasures. Don't worry about satisfactions. But many of the letters that I read in my research are not written by famous people. They are people from the past, near and far past, whose lives in many ways are not so very different from mine. They buzz along with their particular worries <laughs> or fears or dreams. And through their letters, these writers come into their own, both in their time and in mine. They also illustrate for me as a historian, history like I, as I like to understand it, history that is very alive, very present. History as inhabited by people who if I had lived then would have been my friends, my neighbors, my leaders, my enemies. For my last book, American Rebels, how the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy families fanned the flames of revolution, I had to dig into the letters of some very well-known figures from history, including John Hancock, John Adams, and Abigail Smith Adams. My book is about how the two Johns and Abigail, along with Dolly Quincy Hancock, Josiah Quincy, and other early activists for American independence, all spent their childhoods in Braintree, Massachusetts. They formed deep connections with each other that lasted into adulthood. Connections which help us understand how they had the courage to rise up against England in the 1760s and 70s. How they had the courage to declare independence for the American colonies. In researching that book, I read through stacks and stacks and stacks of old letters and combed through seemingly endless microfiches of old letters, all in search of those deeply held connections between members of the Hancock, Adams, and Quincy families. As a research fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society, I also had access to the most fantastic collection of letters I have ever seen. And I mean fantastic in every way, not only for my own research, but for absolutely anyone interested in American history, in relationships, in political movements, in the daily life of the 18th and 19th centuries, for anyone interested in humanity, period. I'm talking about the Historical Society's collection of letters written by John and Abigail Adams um, throughout their courtship in the 1760s and into their shared life that lasted until Abigail died in 1818. In John Adams' very first letter to Abigail, which he sent through uh, to her sister Mary, through Mary's fiance, who was a close friend of John's, John made a joke about King George, uh, the young King George then, and rebellion. And it was so funny to think that he would be making this joke about rebelling against King George when in another 13 years or so, that's exactly what he would do. <laughs> but in this 1761 letter, he teases Abigail. He warns her against becoming a most loyal subject to young George. For if Abigail were to show too much favor to George, although my allegiance has been hitherto inviolate, I shall endeavor all in my power to foment rebellion. From that time on, love letters flowed between John and Abigail. 
John called Abigail Miss Adorable, and she professed herself bound to him by a threefold cord of humanity, friendship, and physical attraction. The physical attraction between them comes through in the letters, with John demanding as many kisses and as many hours of your company as I can have, and Abigail replying with the endearment of my friend, which is a term of considerable intimacy in the 18th century. One letter she sent ended with, accept this hasty scrawl warm from my heart. Accept this hasty scrawl from the heart of your sincere Diana. She signed many of her letters, Diana, and he would sign his Lysander. Lysander was a heroic Spartan admiral and Diana was the Roman goddess of the moon and hunting. Although I was at, able to, uh, to see the actual letters written by John and Abigail, the digitized version of this treasure of letters is available to anyone. They're not only digitized, but they're also transcribed, which is really helpful, um, and searchable by words or, and terms. So I still make it part of my weekly routine just to give myself happiness um, to go onto the site, put in a word such as here, um, I put in the word geese. I'm gonna search the word geese. Um, and I want the letters uh, to be written by Abigail, received by John. And then I, I get a, these are the letters that are found. And then I click and I found the letter, in, the letter that I want to read. And it's a charming, funny, slice of life, lie on the wall letter. And it means so much to me to be able to see that. And anyone can go to the Massachusetts Historical site, uh, society site, and, 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 and troll through the, these letters. And I just recommend that you do. It's just such a pleasure. I have looked back over millennia of letter writing to understand the particular and wonderful qualities of letters that make them such an enduring method of communication. And I have found so um, many reasons to write a letter. Uh, to build a bridge across time and space, to communicate freely and in privacy, to create proof, to create a unique and singular document. Why do I read letters? As a historian, letters provide that vital living link to the past. But even more, in the letters I've read, I've been witness uh, to tenderness and kindness, advice, and generosity, and also to love, all kinds and forms and sorts of love. It is that ability to see the best that's in humanity through letters that go back through centuries that has made the, any research that I do for any book, I always go to letters and it, it's such a fulfilling way to spend time to read letters from the past. Um, and I also very much like getting letters in the present. <laughs> I will um, close today, and then I'll be happy to take questions, but I'm going to close with a letter written by John Hancock to his beloved Dolly Quincy, pledging his love forever. The courtship between John and Dolly lasted for over 11 years. Um, but finally resulted in a wedding in August of 1775 in a house just up the road from where I live now. The house was burned down by the British during the Revolutionary War and Dolly and John are obviously long gone, although we still have their portraits. And there are lovely portraits painted by Hugh Copley. And of course we have histories filled with all their amazing deeds uh, done on behalf of the colonists fighting for independence, including American rebels that I wrote. And their letters remain. Their letters, they're a bridge to the past, proof of their love, and a wonderful window into humanity, past and present. Thank you. Now I'm happy to, to, um, to take questions. Thank you, Nina. That was so wonderful. I, I will admit I, I, I got a little verklempt for on the uh, the Korean wife. Oh, I mean, too. <laughs> me too. Me too. Heartbreaker. I think yeah. mine could have been a little more angry, like 
you know, you said. <laughs> yeah, you said you'd stay here for me. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, incredibly powerful. Uh, some of the chat, uh, you know, folks are other fellow historians who all are now deeply jealous of your family. <laughs> that really is such a, a treasure trove. It reminds me a great oh. deal of the, the Bradbury letters that I found um, in the course of my research. It's amazing how you can rebuild a life. Yeah. Just how wonderful. Yeah. So let me uh, let me just go to uh, a question here from the Q&A section from Natasha. Even before the ubiquity of texts and emails, thank you for making me say the word ubiquity. <laughs> Thanks. Can you tell when the decline in letter writing began? That is, just considering American history, do famous people still write letters? Lyndon Johnson, John Kennedy, Richard Nixon, Obama, Trump. Uh, everyone that she mentions, except for Trump, um, we do have their letters. Uh, I don't think Trump writes letters. Just I've never seen one. Um, Obama has written letters. I've heard of uh, people have gotten wonderful letters from him. Um, I also want to shout out to Obama. Yesterday, he did a wonderful message about independent bookshops, and he contacted all these different independent bookshop um, owners, and I just thought that was great, so shout out. Um, and of course, Lyndon Johnson's letters uh, are so important in, in, in the work that's been done on his biography. I mean, I do think that uh, political figures do tend to write letters, but I do think many of those are very curated letters. The, the sort of open fly on the wall letters that I find so fascinating in my research, like the letters between John and Abigail, um, which uh, they just write about everything to each other with no, uh, with no censor. Those are, 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 are incredible. I don't know how, how, how much those letters are still being written today. And I don't know when they, they began to, to die out. I, I definitely, when I, I did research um, for my book into Arthur Ashe, and um, there were many letters on the record. So that's the 60s, 70s, 80s, there are still letters being written. But I think we all know we're receiving fewer letters in the mail from, from friends and family. I do think that thank you letters are still being written and condolence letters. And what is so wonderful about a condolence letter when you receive one is how the person will share not only how, how they hope that you feel better, but when they share a memory they have of the person um, that they're writing about, it really is so nice to read that and to realize that the person that you're grieving for is still here for a lot of people in memories that are shared and in memories that are shared in letters. So that kind of letter writing definitely persists. I also have seen um, articles that have told me that during COVID letter writing has stepped up. So I'm hoping that that is true. Um, my youngest son, when he went to college, I have four boys, and when the youngest went off to college, he did write me letters. So, um, so I have his letters. Then he was sent home from college and has been home <laughs> during COVID, but hopefully when he goes back to college, he will continue to write me letters. Um, but I think the quite that, you know, Natasha was asking about sort of these political figures that she mentions. And as I say, I think they still write letters. I think they're curated. What I'd like to know are the personal letters that they still write. Um, and I'm sure Jimmy Carter has written some pretty good letters to his wife, and maybe we'll see those in the future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so Glee asks a question that I think many of us uh, were wondering. Uh, have you had any connection to the family of the, uh, that is associated with the letters that you found in the shed? Well, as soon as we found the letters, we, um, we contacted our, our um, realtor and said, you know, we found this, this complete trunk full of family letters of the Seligman family. Can you please contact the seller and let us know what, you know, how we can get these letters back to them? Some time went by and then we heard from the realtor that the family didn't want the letters. Um, and we were really kind of surprised by that, but okay, we'll hang on to them. And once I started writing my book, I reached out to, to some Seligmans that I could find, um, you know, through online searches. And people expressed interest in the work that I was doing, but no one really asked for the letters. So I was very happy that Princeton wanted a lot of the letters. Um, and I have a lot of the remaining Seligman family letters. And I have the bonnet and I have the pl glass plate photographs. And I'm not really sure what will happen to those 
when my time comes, but you know, hang on to them in the, in the meantime. Well, oh, that's such an interesting it. question. You know, when you become the, the steward of a family history, that's not necessarily that's not your, my history. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a question for sure. We should talk about that offline sometime. Yeah. Um, we have a comment from uh, Christina who says, I'm a poet and historian and would love to talk to you about your work. So I'm thinking this would be a great time to just let folks know how they can contact you uh, to buy your book or learn more about your book or ask a question. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm on Instagram as Nina Sankovic. Um, easy way to find me, easy way to message me. I'm on Facebook, Nina Sankovic, easy way. Uh, and then uh, my website, www.readallday.org um, is where you can learn more about me, but probably the easiest way to contact me is Instagram or Facebook. Wonderful. All right, we have time for one last question and it's a doozy, I, I love this question. <laughs> this is from Leslie. I have love letters that my grandfather sent to my grandmother, but not on the other side. I also have photographs of their courtship in the teens of the last century. How do you go about writing their story with only one side of the conversation? Well, that is such a good question. Um, and, and one I don't, I, you know, you can only write it from one side. You can only make guesses as to what the response might have been. I mean, what's so great about the John and Abigail correspondence is that both sides are there and that it, the, the people at the historical society who worked on that collection have made it very clear what letter went when and who was wrote back to who and when it was received. Um, but for most of us, yeah, the letters that we have are going to be one-sided. Um, when I the one reason I started to research the Lowells was that when I was writing this book about letters, I wanted to include letters of Amy Lowell, who I've been crazy about since I was literally in elementary school. I, I just loved her poetry. And um, so I looked for letters of Amy Lowell and I found out that she had put in her will that all of her letters should be burned after she died. She wanted to maintain her privacy. So I was bereft, like, oh my gosh, all the Amy Lowell letters are gone. But of course, once I started looking, no, they weren't gone. Only the letters she had control of were gone. So I was able to find so many letters that she had written because people of course saved those letters. What I don't have are necessarily the letters that got sent back to her because she burned them. But um, so there, there we have to piece it together. It's a puzzle. I mean, at any history that you write is always putting puzzle pieces together. As you know, Bethany, I mean, it's just pulling any kind of hints. It's like being, it's like writing a mystery. <laughs> You're putting together all the pieces and coming up with the answer. Um, so just consider, I say to, to the person who asked the question, consider it such a gift that you have those love letters. Oh my gosh. Um, and just work with what you have. That's what I'd say. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I would say that my, in my experience, often, uh, hints, you can extrapolate what was in yeah. the letter, the previous letter by, by what is answered in the letter. Right. Right. So sometimes that's a little bit of a hint, although you always miss hearing the full other side. <laughs> what a great question. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but I know some of you have, uh, have, can, have still have questions that have not been answered. So I encourage you to um, get in touch with Nina. I know she's very helpful and friendly and I'm sure we'd be happy to hear from you. So I'll be happy to hear. thank you. And thank you again so much. I think we were all very inspired. Now, everybody go write a letter. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good Sunday. Thank you. Bye, Nina. Bye-bye.